Hi, this is Donovan, and I'm going to continue in chapter three. Uh, this is the second part of chapter three of part two, Sex and Sacrament. This chapter is on music and the arts, and this section is on, uh, it's called Experiencing God's Presence Through Dance, Theater, and Film, or Liturgy. What all these things we've talked about so far all these things from episode one till now, um, all these, what are, they all have in common, whether they're different kinds of prayer, different kinds of meaningful rituals that include water and food, like baptism and communion, deep, deep emotions <clears throat> that move us to grow in, com in compassion and vulnerable love, um, or music, like the last uh, episode, is that they could be ways that we share together as human beings uh, in connecting with a creative and loving source and power beyond ourselves, whatever that is for us. An ancient word for this in Western traditions is liturgy. And that's a churchy word, but it's one that actually has really simple, universal meaning. In ancient times, liturgy just meant public works. And by public works, I mean literally like what public works mean in cities now, for example, uh, urban planning, like building roads, building bridges, infrastructure. It's work that's done by, by people for people uh, in response to a critical need in the life of the community. And um, one scholar says, uh, uh, it's, it's actually uh, Richard Henderson, I think, or Robert Henderson forgot his first name, R. Henderson. Anyway, he's an Episcopal uh, priest and writer. Um, but anyway, so what he says about this is these works knit communities together and provide something crucial for them to grow and flourish. So that's, you know, in terms of public infrastructure building from ancient times till now, and, and it still has that meaning when we use it in terms of religious communities, or religious communities who use this word liturgy to describe what they do together are using their skills and resources expressed through worship traditions, um, engaging the senses in music, words, light, candles, colored uh, stained glass, water, food, human touch, like the passing of the peace, a lot of people will shake hands as part of their greeting uh, or even exchange hugs, anointing, uh, laying hands on people or anointing with oil or even uh, anointing with water and baptism, foot washing. All these are, we, are, are ways that human beings come together to meet human needs for creation, uh, connection with the creator, spirit, the source of unconditional love the source of all beauty, the source of goodness and truth, in ways that tingle our senses, make us realize we're alive, all so that we can learn and grow. In other words, delight, instruct, move. In ancient times, theater, building, and performances were called liturgy. They were public works. They were considered necessary for the community community's well-being. Some ancient theaters were also temples. And in the West, at least, the theatrical tradition as a whole may be descended from performances at religious festivals. Ancient Greek tragedies and ancient Greek philosophy had some mutual influence on each other um, and influenced each other's development. And this is something that Augustine of Hippo, the African church father, talks about in his autobiography, Confessions. Both drama, theater arts, and philosophy had charms that were so fascinating to Augustine that he expresses a lot of caution about their potential to be distractions from the deeper life of selfless love that he was drawn to after he converted. So he kind of pushes those away a bit. He adds a lot of cautions to his reader about how much do you want to engage theater? Maybe it's something you should stay away from. But Augustine was self-admittedly extreme in his appetites for pleasure, 
and theater was not the only thing he struggled with to the point that he felt he wasn't able to enjoy these in moderation and so he lived a very austere life after conversion he lived the life of a monk that doesn't mean everybody's called to be a monk um and he, did, he didn't even claim that it's just he knew himself well enough to know there were some things he had to stay away to, uh, away from his celibacy, for example, and his avoidance of public entertainment are not universal standards. They're just one person's way of coping with excessive distractions. So instead of focusing on that, I just want to point out that, that he talks both about how ancient liturgy worked and how ancient theater worked in those days. And um, he's also the one that keeps telling us if beauty points you to God, it's a good thing. If something delights you and it teaches you and it helps you and moves you to change and grow and be of service, then that's a good thing. It's pointing you toward God. So um, I want to go back to sensual, whole body theatrical prayer as something that actually we find even in the Bible. It erupts from biblical heroes like David who dances with all his might the bible says that twice in just one little passage describing him dancing he's dancing with all his might so much it has to be affirmed twice and he's dancing in the streets as he celebrates god's presence with really noisy musicians even back then it i um i used a very salty phrase here um let's say it shook up how about that i'll say it shook up um, the self-righteous and condescending people, religious people who witnessed it. So, so you could have a very religious person celebrating in this very raucous, dancey, theatrical, noisy, musical way, and other religious people, even in the Bible, don't like it. So, both sides of this are recorded, you know, in the Bible. Um, that I guess that's my point here because I've been getting a little bit of blowback from these videos and. Uh, I, I still need to share what I'm sharing. I'm sharing, it's just like I was saying about Augustine, you know, I'm just one person. He shared what he shared. Other people see it differently. David did what he did. His wife saw it differently. This is just my take on these things that I'm sharing um, in a friendly way. So anyway, so sometimes people get shook up when they see someone worshiping in an exuberant way. Uh, David joyfully makes music with all Israel, the Bible says, using every instrument they had available, it seems. There's a long list of all the instruments they used, and they played with all their might, <laughs> the Bible tells us. He shouts loudly, and he dances in what seems to be only his priestly underwear, linen ephod. That's what it, he was basically in his underwear, in a public procession in the street in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, this is all in Second Samuel chapter 6, if you I want to look it up. Uh, the Bible tells us that God, God delighted in this scandalous, over-the-top celebration in underwear in public. Uh, but also that David's royal wife was so embarrassed that she publicly lashed out at him in rage. Um, David is the one, too, to whom are attributed the words of Psalm 30, You have changed my sorrow into dancing. You have taken away my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. You wanted me to praise you and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. And I've quoted that psalm before in, the, in this series. But the dancing David is an image that, um, that I really want to draw on right now. Exuberant celebration of delight in God is shameless, unselfconscious, joyous, delightful, and even theatrical at times. All of the human experiences God created and can point us to God and can connect us with God and delights God when we let it. Francis of Assisi is someone I want to look at now. Francis of Assisi was a medieval mystic and he practiced and taught this very well. This, this idea that everything can point us to God. He wrote poetry, he wrote songs, he preached to the birds. That's even people that don't know Francis or saints or Christian tradition at all, sometimes know this little bald man in, a, in garden statues holding a bird uh, or, or the story that there was some 
pious man that liked to preach to the birds. You may know nothing else about Francis or about about that whole tradition, but you may know that, that he preached to the birds. He saw all of nature as a blessing and as a sign of God's presence with us. All that God created for Francis is a sibling to us, brother sun, sister moon. This is in his very famous Canticle of the Creatures. Francis of Assisi taught and lived a way of peace and equality. Living outside the city walls, this is in the, in the Middle Ages when, um, in Europe at least, he, people would live inside the city walls if, if at all they could, if they had anything at all. Um, these sort of fortress cities. But he lived, he chose, he was a, he was from a mercantile family, a family of uh, cloth dyers and, and, and sellers of cloth. Um, but it, so he, they were actually pretty quite wealthy, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, part of the rising middle class at that time. And he left that behind. He went outside the city walls and lived with those who were feared, who were untouchable in his times. In other words, in specific, he was living with people with leprosy, people who actually wore bells on their necks so that others could hear them coming and run away, keep socially distanced from these people who at that time had a then incurable disease. Just so you know, so we don't stigmatize folks that have leprosy today. Today it's treatable. Back then it was not. So um, people were very frightened of, of other people that had leprosy and they would run away. So they were people with leprosy were socially outcast. You know, even in a society that didn't practice social distancing, they did when it was people with leprosy. So, um, so Francis chose to go outside the city walls and live with those folks, folks that, like I said, had bells on their necks so that other people could run away from them. He ran to them. When I was a kid growing up in a violent alcoholic home, and I do want to say folks involved in that home have since recovered, so I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus here. I'm just saying in that time, I didn't know that folks were going to recover yet at that time. I was just a kid, and it was what it was at that moment. So I lived in a violent alcoholic home. I was surrounded by, we were surrounded by neighbors in very lower working class or less neighborhood who either ignored the violence they could overhear the police car showing up that sort of thing or they made it very clear how understandably they were offended by our presence uh, by our little family struggles that they could overhear and kind of witness from our appearance and i was taught at that time a reasonable skepticism of religions. I can certainly understand why people would be skeptical of religions. And I was taught to be skeptical of the hypocrisy of, of people who claimed to be religious. Again, all that's very understandable. At the same time, my family went to see this film, Brother, Son, Sister, Moon, that I just kind of referenced when I quoted that part from the Canticle of the Creatures. Film critics and church historians critique aspects of that film. So I'm not trying to argue that it's a great film in terms of film history or church history. All I'm trying to share is that sitting in that movie theater when I was 10 years old, that watching that film for me was a means of grace. And I'm just sharing that because this, this little section in this chapter is about how film, acting, theatricality, dancing, these can be means of grace. For me, that was a means of grace in that context. That's why I shared the context with you. Sitting in the movie theater, um, the music, the colors, the emotions, and some people critique this is a very emotional film. It's very touchy-feely. That's not to everybody's tastes. It touched me. It moved me. It delighted, instructed, and moved me. Okay. And the sheer humanity of it, the palpable human suffering of feudalistic medieval society that it portrayed, the poverty, the leprosy, the gap between the haves and the have-nots, and most people in feudalistic medieval society being have-nots, the fierce protection of their comforts and luxuries by the very few whose religious, political, and financial power intertwined and mutually reinforced each other um, who kept their wealth and social distance while 
most folks were suffering. That did not seem historical to me as a little 10 year old child. That seemed real, immediate, and in way too many ways, no different from what I was witnessing all around me growing up in an industrial city in the US right after the Vietnam War during the Nixon four years. Francis and his friends embodied a truth that for me was new at that time, that regardless of the violence around us, we can choose to live in peace with all, to live simply in community and to be of service together rather than to be mean, selfish and competitive. Although of course I stumble, I've been trying to travel in that direction ever since. In his time, Francis helped everyday people within the city walls to understand the Bible at a time when there was no printing press, most folks couldn't read anyway, and even when read aloud, the Bible was in scholarly Latin, a language everyday people didn't understand. So he staged, in a theatrical way, he staged reenactments of one of the most of the most important messages of the Gospels. It was Francis who came up with the idea of constructing full-size nativity scenes, manger scenes, uh, with regular people acting the parts of the biblical story of God literally taking on a human body, taking the form of the infant Jesus. I'll say baby Jesus, because I want this to be more, he was really bringing it down to earth. Uh, God was and Francis was. How powerful this message is in a time and place where the human body was beset by incurable illnesses like leprosy and the plague. God becoming flesh, and that's what incarnation literally means, wasn't a pretty image when human flesh could easily be seen and smelled everywhere, rotting away while people were still alive. And most people in this feudal society were poor, living precariously, just like Mary, Joseph, and little Jesus. God, they could see with their own eyes in these living nativity scenes being acted out, is one of us. Francis is also credited with staging in another theatrical kind of liturgy, the first Stations of the Cross. It's another living reenactment. I know this is not part of everyone's tradition, um, I'll explain it, and I'm actually going to do a guided practice of it um, following this explanation. This time of Jesus' nonviolent resistance to suffering and the way other poor and working class people supported him in his last moments. So, so the, the Stations of the Cross is a reenactment of Jesus' behavior and how other people support, sort of peer support, um, from the trial to the crucifixion. So uh, it, it, you stop and you meditate during the Station of the Cross on people who, at great risk to their own lives, shared with him in whatever ways they could. Again, almost every time, these are very poor or working class people that we, we meditate on how they're interacting with Jesus on the road or how he's dealing with it. Um, in walking meditation, it's a, it's a form of walking meditation in the Christian tradition, along this reenacted Via Dolorosa, or Way of Sorrows, uh, of Jesus on his journey to the trial and, and crucifixion, or sometimes it's after the trial. There's, there's different versions of this. We're invited to stop several times along the way to pray and meditate on specific responses to involuntary suffering. So here's where I was going to break into the guided practice, but I'm actually going to, I'm going to do a little bit of the um, sort of setting the stage <laughs> be, and, and then I'll, then I'll stop the camera and I'll, and I'll film the guided practice separately. Um, anyone can use prayer to deepen our relationship with God. For 16th century Spanish mystics, John of the Cross, who described his lovical, loving mystical union with Jesus in homoerotic poetry, I've already talked about that. He describes laying on Jesus' breast. Um, and his for, for John of the Cross's teacher, Teresa of Avila, periodic suffering is a normal part of a progressively deepening experience of complete union with God to be expected rather than to be avoided or denied. 
acknowledging the reality of suffering as part of our spiritual journey allows us more clearly to trust God's work in and through that suffering. And again, I'm not talking about suffering that we cause for ourselves, uh, um, uh, at least, you know, not that we're going out of our way to suffer or we're trying to heap suffering or causing suffering. I'm just talking about the inevitable experiences of life. If it comes to us, how do we get through it? Teresa calls this journey of prayer a way of daily living in friendship with God. By meditating on Jesus' own experience of suffering, again, he didn't go out of his way to create them, but he accepted them and he dealt with them some kind of way when they happened. We pray with Jesus, deepening that relationship. Rather than merely reciting words to God, like in vocal prayer, this takes us, to, it's a different experience of prayer. We meditate deeply on who Jesus is and who we are in him as a way of life and relationship. We spend time alone, devoted to God, without distraction or reservation, discovering more about our beloved, motivated by our love for him in the same way that couples in love desire to know each other more deeply through shared mutual presence, sharing time, sharing their company, I have a little typo in here. Um, yep. Okay. Um, so like lovers do, we can spend time with God with or without words. Like a cord of many strands that's not easily broken, drawing on our human ways of loving, like philos and eros in addition to agape, uh, only strengthens the divine gift of love of God and with God. So I just want to give a, before we get into the guided practice and I turn off the camera for that, um, I want to give a little historical background on this practice, okay? St. Helena of Constantinople, I, lo I love to bring in when women teachers have guided a practice uh, because they've often been ignored in some religious histories. So St. Helena of Constantinople, who was the mother of um, Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, started life as a West Asian stable maid from what is now Turkey. When she was about 80 years old, so she's an elderly Asian woman, she made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem using her sway as the emperor's mother to help recover sites that were holy to Christians, such as Jesus' tomb, that had been buried under Greco-Roman Greco temples work for which she's still renowned in some traditions as the patron saint of archaeologists. Under her supervision, shrines and churches were built at these recovered holy sites. Pilgrims could even walk Jesus' path along the Dolorosa or the Way of Sorrows, the Via Dolorosa, like I was saying before. So later in medieval Italy, an aspiring knight who failed to make this pilgrimage to the Holy Land due to injury and illness, that's what he was trying to do when he had his mystical experience. He, he came up with a mystical way of traveling this path with Jesus simply by praying the Stations of the Cross. And today, of course, he's known as Francis of Assisi. So that's who I'm talking about there. So that that's part of the background as to why he created this, that he actually wanted to go and do it in person the way um, St. Helena had started doing it and Christians since then had followed. He never made it to... The Holy Land because he was physically frail and then he, he was involved in service to suffering poor sick people in his own neighborhood so he he came up with this way this more theatrical and mystical and liturgical way I guess you could say of, of praying um, the way of sorrows so the path of sorrows or the way of the cross via crucis is sometimes called and is a name that dates from the 16th century and it refers to the route that Jesus walked in Jerusalem, painfully carrying the cross toward Calvary. Um, some call it Calvary. The Aramaic name is Golgotha or the Skull. They're both that's two different names for the same thing, just different languages. The, the journey starts when Jesus is judged and condemned by Pilate at the site of the former Roman fortress Antonia. I'm giving you all this because when we pray it, we're not, I'm not going to give you historical context and break into these stories okay so the first when we when we first start our pr little prayer meditation this is what we're kind of thinking about this is this is setting the stage this is a stage that um in fact francis sets for us kind of like cast your mind back to the fortress antonia uh where herod lived 
the Jewish dignitary who enforced Roman rule among his occupied people. So again, there's some folks I hang out with today that would be able to really relate to this, that um, this is starting with a, a colonized people whose land has been taken away. Um, Jesus is of those people. Jesus is of the indigenous people of his time and place. He is not of the colonizers. So he's going to the place where the, yeah, this, yeah. So Herod, Herod is of the indigenous people, but he's enforcing the colonizers' rule. This is where this is where we start. So the path of sorrows then proceeds to Golgotha, the site of Jesus' crucifixion, and ends at Jesus' tomb. So we have a lot of stops along the way. Since the late Middle Ages, fourteen stations of the cross mark the route. Um, now, what those 14 are differs from practice to practice. There's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of similarities. Um, I've tried to create a guided practice that draws on what is both most traditional and you'll see it's got a flavor of what's most meaningful to me, what I think is more universal for those within and outside the tradition that may want to practice this. Just um, since the late Middle Ages, like I said, there's 14 stations of the cross that mark the route. Pilgrims in Jerusalem itself begin at the Monastery of the Flagellation, where Jesus was not only questioned and condemned by Pilate, but also scourged or whipped and crowned with thorns. Uh, the second, so that's, that's where we start. Uh, the second station is the Arch of Ecce Homo, Behold the Man the side where Roman soldiers gambled for Jesus' clothes, where Pilate shows Jesus to the crowd. At the third station, pilgrims meditate on Jesus' first fall on the path under the weight of the cross, then fourth on the meeting between Jesus and his mother. Now these are all, this is how the, the Via Crucis or the actual street that's preserved in Jerusalem, this is what I'm describing the archaeological sites and the stops on this path in Jerusalem physically. It's not quite, what we're going to do is based on that, but it's not limited to that. Um, fifth, the fifth station, pilgrims could consider pilgrims, by pilgrims I mean visitors to Jerusalem who are going there to make this holy walk. Con, um, they consider the encounter between Jesus and Simon the Cyrenian who carries Jesus' cross to Golgotha or Calvary both two names for the same thing, as affirmed in the Synoptic Gospels. Sixth, they pray over the meeting between Jesus and a woman who's called Veronica. That's an, a tradition, a naming tradition given to a woman who wiped Christ's face, or Jesus' face, I'm going to say, with her silk veil. And that, um, that veil, or what is alleged to be that veil, is still kept at St. Peter's basilica in rome seventh the seventh station is uh these pilgrims those who are walking this way of the cross in jerusalem will stop and meditate on jesus second fall on the path and then eighth they'll meditate on jesus meeting with the pious women or the daughters of jerusalem um this is from the gospel of luke uh chapter 23. the ninth station is the third fall of jesus and then from the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th uh, stations are all in the same spot. They're all in, the, in Jerusalem's Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the tomb. So traditionally, these, uh, these stations of the cross that are practiced right there at that Church of the Holy Tomb, are, uh, they include uh, Jesus being stripped of his garments, Jesus being nailed to the cross, uh, where he promises his kingdom to the repentant thief, or sometimes called the good thief, uh, Jesus dying on the cross, and Jesus taken down from the cross, and Jesus placed in the tomb. Now, some contemporary Christians add the resurrection as a non-traditional 15th station. So outside of that pilgrimage in Jerusalem, if you're not actually in physically in Jerusalem walking that literal street and going to those literal places, uh, Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, and Protestant Christians, especially Anglican and Lutheran Christians, have continued 
the medieval Franciscan practice of meditating on Jesus' final hours in groups or individually, most commonly during Lent. But I'm going to take you through this in a season that's not Lent. And in fact, we're getting perilously close to Advent. Um, but, you know, we're very close to the Dia de los, de los Muertos. We're very close to All Saints Eve uh, and All, All Saints Day. So, um, I don't know. And just with what we're going through in the world, walking on the way of sorrows, it seems like it's always relevant. But... Um, it seems very relevant to me right now. So for what it's worth, I'll be guiding that practice. Uh, it's usually done during Lent by, by many people who practice it. Um, Lent be, is the 40-day season of reflection that leads to Easter, the day that celebrates Jesus' resurrection from the dead. So the goal of this ancient, still widespread devotional practice is to make a spiritual pilgrimage when we can't make a physical pilgrimage, by prayerfully meditating on the sufferings of Jesus Christ, perhaps even as a part of our unceasing effort to stand beside the endless crosses on which the Son of God continues to be crucified. And here, um, that's a quote from Pope John Paul II, but I really was thinking much more of liberation theology and in fact, you know, the people who are most like Jesus, who are suffering things that Jesus himself was suffering on this way of sorrow. So indigenous people, peoples who've been colonized, enslaved, um, is this certainly the things that happened to Jesus are still happening. Um, and, and, yeah. Uh, though the Bible itself admits not all Jesus did has been written down, it's in John 21, some Christians have concerns about the traditional stations of the cross, since a few are not explicitly identified in the Christian scriptures. And so I wanted to address that now before I guide the practice, because the people that leave comments on my page or who try to reach out to me when I'm live streaming this usually have some very negative things to say. So I understand. I'm well aware. Everybody's well aware who's studied the stations of the cross that not every single one of these is mentioned in scripture. So I'm going to share with you that a few evangelicals have found creative ways to modify this Lenten devotional practice to keep it entirely Bible-centered, as in and this following example from the university where I used to work as a theology professor. I had nothing to do with setting this up. This is the art department put this together. Anyway, they, they um, my point here is just that a conservative evangelical community can come up with a Bible-centered set of Stations of the Cross. So for them, the Stations of the Cross were, one, Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26. Two, Jesus is betrayed by Judas and is arrested, Matthew, that's in Mark 14. Three, Jesus is condemned by the Sanhedrin, that's Luke 22. Four, Jesus is denied by Peter, Matthew 26. Five, <laughs> I can count. Jesus is judged by Pilate, Mark 15. Six, Jesus is scourged and crowned with thorns, John 19. Seven, Jesus bears the cross, John 19. Eight, Jesus is helped by Simon the Cyrenean in, to carry the cross, Mark 15. Nine, Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem, Luke 23. You can see there's a lot of overlap here with the traditional stations of the cross. Ten, Jesus is crucified, Luke 23. 11, Jesus promises his kingdom to the good thief or the repentant thief, Luke 23. 12, Jesus speaks to his mother and the disciple, his beloved disciple, Mark 15. 13, Jesus cry, uh, dies on the cross, Luke 23. And 14, Jesus is placed in the tomb, Matthew 27. So there's just a great deal of overlap between the traditional um archaeological version uh the way francis prays it and what's in the bible it's maybe not perfect but it's it's a meditation practice so it's meant to evoke closeness with god um or or as as you know just touched on briefly here a uh, uh, compassion for human suffering that moves us to act differently so with that said i'm gonna stop there and um, we'll do the guided practice in a separate video. And thank you. <laughs>